Good morning. Thank you for uh, accommodating the court being here a bit early. Uh, the next case is State versus McCoy, and we will hear from the appellant. Thank you. 
As I understand what the state's position is here, the state says that it did not open the door in the testimony of the decedent's father as to the conduct and the disposition of the decedent on that day in terms of being happy and the interactions with uh, the family members and so forth. How did that type of questioning and answering open the door to guns and other uh, depictions and photos in the cell phone, and how would that be relevant?
this is a question that has to be in front of the Florida governor, Sandy Davis County governor, Sandy Davis. Gets to come in anyhow and harass the plaintiffs. And it gets addressed in this court's opinion when it does not appear that the issue was ever raised in front of the governor. It's raised on appeal by the state. It's raised on appeal by the plaintiffs. This court has consistently ruled on the basis of our opinion that the record is here. This court can review it. It's really an issue of law. Something that was the judge's sense of the entire courtroom and the rulings and the credibility of each one of these parties to just a collapse. Well, we're not mad at this court for any of these things. It's raised. It's raised on the question of justice. Plaintiffs get to make their pitch. Assuming your position to be true, how was this prejudicial error from the standpoint that if the motion in limine had not been allowed and the cell phone photos and other depictions on it would have been allowed to have come in, how would it therefore have been the reasonable possibility of a different result for your client? You understand. Here's what we know about what the jury did. We know they were convinced that David McCoy was acting in self-defense in fear for his life, trying to defend himself. We also know that they were convinced the adversaries were about that he used too much force. He fired the first shot. It appears from the evidence that the first shot was fired when he was standing next to his car and Mr. Bagley was on the same side of the road and the shot was fired from the window of the car. That was not the first shot. There was another shot fired as Mr. Bagley was crossing the street next to one of the kids who was living in the house. Mr. McCoy's testimony was he thought he was circling around looking at it from a vantage point or something like that. If the jury believed the plaintiff's testimony that Mr. Bagley was the first man that had a gun, didn't have a gun but was armed, then it wouldn't explain why they decided that the evidence was sufficient to show that he was armed. That was too much force to be used. If Mr. Bagley was shown a contrary picture coming up self-defense, then this plaintiff wouldn't have been treated with that way. That makes it stronger. Counsel, wasn't... That can make them string up all kinds of arguments that we don't know what the jury believed, but it's certainly reasonably possible they would have found the state had failed to rule the truth of the case. Counsel, wasn't there a witness who testified that Brandon was running away, who saw Brandon running away when McCoy fired the shots? How would this testimony impact the jury's view of whether that was credible or not? There was a witness, maybe more than one, who saw Brandon up there in the road like she was running in the neighborhood. Mr. McCoy's car is here. Mr. Brandon's car had moved between the post and our street. Mr. McCoy's car is in the ditch because he was trying to get away from Mr. Brandon. He's in the right side of the road. Mr. Brandon's car is in the left side of the road. There are witnesses who testified that Mr. Brandon was running across the street. McCoy's testimony was, based 
here in the blank house. Thank God. There's no more jobs to see. I'm going to Iran. Meantime, so we can get a fire and make our lives. We can't see the other side. So, yes, there was a difference. No, it's good to sit down and talk. Uh, what she was doing at that time, I don't know. The only person who testified. Save a few minutes for rebuttal if needed. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Council. We'll hear from the appellee. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Uh, Associate Justices, and may it please the court. I'm Ryan Park from the North Carolina Department of Justice, uh, and uh, I represent the state in this case. Uh, I'm joined at council table by my colleague, Lynn Weaver, who handled this case up until now. and. Uh, invited me to present argument because of her competing professional obligations, and I'm glad that she's here today as well. Uh, it is undisputed that the defendant in this case unintentionally shot and killed the victim, a young man named Augustus Brandon, with an AR-15 semi-automatic assault rifle that the defendant kept in his car. The defendant shot Mr. Brandon from a distance on the public streets of Durham at nine o'clock in the morning, right after Mr. Brandon had dropped off his little sister at Riverside High School. The fatal shot was to the back of Mr. Brandon's head, and as two eyewitnesses testified, and this is pages 526 and 450 on the transcript, the, Mr. Brandon was running away as fast as he could to get away when he was shot, when the fatal shot was, sh uh, was shot, uh, and that the force of the blast launched him, that was the testimony, launched him from the middle of the road near the yellow dividing line all the way across the road, across the street. Uh, and he was running away from both of the two parked cars. That was two of the witnesses' testimony. Now, it appears, of course, that the two young men had some sort of youthful rivalry involving cars and immature displays of bravado. Uh, the defendant testified that the victim had once threatened to slap him, but not actually slapped him, that they got in a fight in sixth grade, and uh, that they had once, uh, that the victim had once shown the defendant a video of himself shooting a firearm and bragging about his marksmanship ability and denigrating the victim's mark marksmanship ability. And it, it was undisputed at trial that immediately preceding the, sh the shooting, uh, the two engaged in some sort of car chase where the victim allegedly uh, was following the uh, defendant in an aggressive manner. So based on this testimony, defendant claimed that he had a reasonable fear that when the victim approached his car, that he was under an imminent threat uh, of bodily harm, great bodily harm or, or death. Uh, but the thing that decides this appeal, the state's submission is, is that the jury believed him. The jury believed that he was acting in self-defense but merely held that he was used excessive force in defending himself. And in fact, in acquitting the defendant of first degree murder and second degree murder, those were the only two charges that the state even mentioned in its closing argument. It adopted the defendant's position when he said, when his counsel said at trial that, quote, this is a textbook case of imperfect self-defense. That's transcript page 1543. And he said that a reasonable person would not have uh, shot in the, at the moment th uh, that the shooting took place uh, and that the shooting was reckless and ill-advised. Th these were all statements of, of the defense counsel to the, to the trial court. And so when a person is running away, trying to disengage from an aggressive confrontation, uh, the state's submission is that any possible evidentiary error that related to whether that defendant uh, was armed is simply not prejudicial, regardless of what was on that phone. The, the defendant had no right 
to shoot and kill Mr. Brandon as he was running away, attempting to de-escalate or escape or disengage. Now, there is a threshold issue that we submitted in a memorandum of additional authorities, which relates to the scope of this court's review on the scope of a dissent. And of course, this is an oft-repeated issue that is far beyond the scope of this individual case. And uh, we felt the responsibility to at least inform you of the contours of what was going on below. So, so one, uh, there has been a lot of discussion in the briefs and today about the abuse of discretion standard and whether it should be de novo or abuse of discretion. And uh, we felt the responsibility to at least alert the court that that was not a subject of Judge Tyson's dissent below. It was not uh, mentioned in the notice of appeal that defendant filed in this court. And so we believe that that's uh, not uh, properly before this court. Uh, there's a, a slightly more complicated question on the issue of whether this was error at all because the majority assumed that there was error, but the dissent went on to address both error and prejudice. Uh, and because these are frequently recurring issues, I'm, I'm happy to address any issues in this regard or just discuss them uh, on the merits. So uh, on the abuse of discretion standard. Well, okay, so I, I, you got me to bite here. So let, let me ask you, if, if the majority says there's error, um, but we think it's uh, harmless, and the dissent says there's error, says nothing about whether or not it's harmless. Do we have a disagreement between the two opinions, in your view? Which is, I think, the standard that we've used to say, does it get here uh, on a right to appeal? Yeah, I think in that scenario, uh, the, the court would have clear jurisdiction over whether there was error. Uh, and uh, it would be an open question whether you would go ahead and, and reach the prejudice question. I don't think there's clear, at least case law, that defines whether uh, when there is a division in that way, which kind of mirrors what's happening here, uh, the court can go ahead and address the additional issue. Uh, I think that uh, as a matter of sound judicial administration, it might make sense for the court to go ahead and address the additional issue if it were dispositive to resolving the case rather than remanding it, uh, given all the, the work that you all have done to get up to speed on the case. Um, but I think it's genuinely unclear. The abuse of discretion question is, is easier in, in my view because there really was no mention of it in the dissent. And again, the defendant here didn't make it a subject of his notice of appeal. So what though, if we are looking at the merits question of whether there was error, don't we have to decide what the standard of review is? And uh, so of course we, we often say we won't let the parties stipulate to what the law is, but could we allow the, the Court of Appeals essentially by not raising that issue as a disagreement between a majority and dissent to preclude us from deciding what's the right standard of review for us to, review, to look at the question? I mean, in other words, isn't that issue really gonna be before us no matter what? When, and when we, if we reach the question of um, the error on the merits? Yeah, so I, I agree with that, Your Honor, as a matter of a sound judicial administration, that if there, this court is convinced that the Court of Appeals below, even if there was no disagreement, uh, applied the wrong standard of review, it would make sense for this court to go ahead and opine on, on it. I, I would note that that is not my understanding of the court's prior practice. Uh, the state, in a, in a case that I was involved in in 2019 called State versus Haulers, uh, we uh, filed a PDR on that exact issue. We, we felt that the Court of Appeals had uh, misapplied, or applied the wrong standard of review, and the PDR was denied, and this court went ahead and decided the question based on uh, the de novo standard, and, and we felt it should have been abuse of discretion. Uh, and in that context, especially with that sequence with the not denied PDR, we felt we d it was inappropriate for us to raise the standard of review in that context. Uh, but I, I think regardless, this, this, case, this case could offer an opportunity for how to go about and address those questions on a dissent-based appeal. But just so I'm clear, you, are, you, are you saying the state's position here is that because this is an appeal based on a dissent, that the only issue properly before us is whether or not there was prejudice, given how this dissent is written. Yes, that's our primary submission. That uh, because prejudice was the only thing that truly any of the judges below disagreed on, uh, that that would be the most appropriate way for this court to dispose of the appeal. I do think, of course, this court has the authority to engage in any number of procedural mechanisms to go ahead and address the additional issues, invoking Rule 2 or its inherent authority in other ways. Well, I was actually getting at a different point. This has helped me understand. So what I was saying is, does, does Judge Tyson explain his prejudice reasoning in the dissent? I think that it's fairly within the scope of the dissent, his discussion of prejudice. 
I don't think there is an extended discussion, uh, but that towards the end of the opinion, my understanding uh, is he explicitly references the fact that he believes that the jury could have reached a different outcome. Uh, and so I think that's probably enough to allow this court to have jurisdiction. Yeah. Um, if I could uh, just go to the abuse of discretion standard briefly, uh, I think just a matter of, as a matter of general principles and as precedent, abuse of discretion is the proper standard. So ordinarily, of course, evidentiary matters are reviewed for abuse of discretion. And the test is really which institutional actor is best situated to review a particular issue. And so if it's a fact-based, record-heavy issue, it should, of course, be the trial court. Uh, and that's the case here for opening the door. It's a pretty nuanced determination. We have to really understand the record and know, is this relevant to any issues that were raised uh, on, in the opening? I don't think you can truly analyze it de novo without honestly reading the trial transcript and understanding everything that was going on. And so that's the kind of thing where abuse of discretion is the right standard. And in five cases that we cited on our brief, this is pages 38 and 39, I believe, uh, of the state's brief, in recent times this court has explicitly said abuse of discretion. Uh, I think the best example is State versus Campbell. So I'll just read what the court said. It said, defendant's argument that the state opened the door to this questioning, the initial ellipsis, is without merit. The trial court did not abuse its discretion in refusing to allow this testimony. So that's a pretty fair, at least clear way of addressing that issue. Now, if I could skip to prejudice, unless there are further questions on the abuse of discretion standard, I think that there are three distinct reasons why no reasonable jury could have found the defendant not guilty of voluntary manslaughter. And, and the first is that the excluded evidence was not relevant to the use of force, the excessiveness of, of force at the time. It was, could be very relevant to whether the defendant believed that the victim had a gun and believed that when he approached the car it was because uh, he wanted to engage in violence. Um, but the fatal shot was when the defendant, sorry, the victim was running away. And no matter what's on the phone, there could have been all sorts of uh, horrible things on that phone. It would not affect any, the fact finder's determination as to whether the defendant should have pulled the trigger uh, when the victim was running away. The, and I'll just emphasize again that the jury believed, I think I agree with Mr. Glover, that the, jury, the only re way to read the, the jury verdict is that they believed the defendant thought the victim was armed. And so any issues as to bolstering that determination really aren't relevant to voluntary manslaughter. Second, uh, or, or sorry, the excessiveness determination on, under voluntary manslaughter. So second is it was undisputed at trial, uh, and I believe here today, that the defendant had never seen any of these things that were on the victim's phone. That there were photos and there was text messages uh, that had things that reflected poorly on the victim's character, and the defendant never saw any of that. Uh, so it's not relevant to the defendant's state of mind. So even if there were some possible situation where if the defendant knows more and more and more about a victim's uh, propensity to use weapons and to engage in illegal activity, that that could be relevant to the excessiveness determination, uh, it's, it's not here. Uh, what the, def the defendant was allowed, I'm sorry, the defense counsel was allowed to cross um, examine uh, the state's witnesses and examine uh, the defendant himself about his, the defense's own knowledge about the victim's propensity for violence, associating with people who engaged in acts of violence, who had criminal records, had engaged in ga gang activity, and there was the crucial uh, testimony that the defendant uh, had seen a video of the victim shooting uh, a gun and the victim had showed it to him in, in kind of an aggressive, um, immature way. Uh, and so that was all before the, the, the jury as well. And, and then, so that leads me to the third point, which is what the Court of Appeals held, uh, Judge Zachary held, which is that this was all cumulative, that there was nothing involved in the, in the text messages or the photos that wasn't already presented to the jury. Uh, you know, I would differ with Mr. Glover in terms of the interpretation of the victim's mom's testimony. I think the, if the victim's mom is agreeing on the stand that she knew that her son had recently possessed a firearm. I think that's fairly incriminating evidence and it's, it serves to explain the jury's verdict and their belief that defendant had a good faith belief that um, 
that the victim was approaching his car and was armed at the time, even though that ended up being incorrect. And of course, uh, the victim was 18 years old. Uh, a lot of 18-year-olds have things on their phone that their, their parents don't know about and will give self-serving explanations if they're caught doing something not, they're not supposed to do. So I think the jury can use its common sense uh, in that regard as well. I think because it relates to some points that uh, Mr. Glover made in the opening presentation, I just want to clarify a few factual things specifically relevant to whether the victim actually had a firearm at that time. I don't think that there's any possible way you can read the record and believe that uh, the victim actually had a firearm at the time, was actually shooting. So uh, I point to a couple things. One is it's undisputed that when the defendant was initially interviewed by the investigating officers, he uh, admitted that he had never seen a gun on Mr. Brandon uh, at the time, and that, was, that persisted through trial. Um, he admitted that he shot Mr. Brandon as he was running away, uh, and he told the investigating officers that he had never saw a firearm and, and didn't hear any gunshots. So that last uh, piece of testimony is that transcript page 1173, that he never heard any gunshots. And he repeated that at trial, actually, uh, initially. So this is transcript pages 1456 and 57. The question was, you didn't see a gun then, did you? And the answer, I didn't see anything in question. You didn't hear any gunshots? Answer, not that I remember, sir. Uh, and then about an hour later, he revised his testimony and he said that he did in fact hear gunshots. Uh, and I think that is something that the court can consider in its prejudice analysis. And, and finally, as I mentioned, there were two eyewitnesses who, they saw the shooting. They were driving by uh, on the public road and they saw the shots being fired and the victim um, perishing. And they both said that the victim was running away as fast as he could to get away. That's Worley. And then Craig said, uh, running with everything he had to escape. Uh, and then law enforcement officers came on the scene within minutes, it was uh, in Durham. Uh, and they conducted a thorough search. No one ever found a weapon and there were three shell casings found, and the defendant admitted to shoot, shooting three shots, and all three matched an AR-15 rifle. So if there's no questions on prejudice, I'll, I'll speak for a few moments on the actual evidentiary issue here. Um, the case law on opening the door uh, makes clear that this is a highly fact-specific determination, and uh, what the court said in Lynch uh, is that it's to correct inaccuracies or misleading omissions, what it said in Albert, is it has to be relevant to the particular fact or transaction raised by the other side. So it's not the kind of rule where if the state or the defendant, whoever presents the testimony, uh, presents evidence on some general topic, and then the other side gets to present whatever evidence they, they want on that general topic. If that were the rule, then it would really bypass all of the rules of evidence because there are, as the court is aware, very detailed and finely reticulated rules of evidence for determining whether you can impeach a, a, gov a government witness uh, through their knowledge uh, of uh, a relevant person's prior bad acts, uh, whether uh, a, how you can prove a victim was the initial aggressor uh, in a confrontation to, to bolster a self-defense uh, argument. And if this opening the door principle were allowed in a case like this, where the evidence was, or the testimony was, you know, my son was a happy guy, that would really bypass all of the rules of evidence. And, and that would be a, a rule that, as Mr. Glover mentioned, would be neutral and would affect the state in certain cases, affect the defendants in certain cases, but allow basically any party to make arguments that they can just ignore the rules of evidence. And that's not how the court has applied it. So one example I would give is State versus Campbell. So in that case, it was another murder case, and uh, this is not a murder case on appeal. And uh, the state presented evidence about items that were found in the victim's home, and no ordinary items like uh, trousers that had, had blood on them, uh, a wallet, that sort of thing. And the defendant said, I want, that opens the door to any evidence about what was found in the victim's home, and he wanted to present evidence about sexual paraphernalia to bolster his defense uh, that the victim had made a homosexual advance on him and he had panicked, uh, and that was his defense. And this court said, that's not how opening the door works. It's not a, a general topic, and then you can just ask anything about uh, the general topic. It has to be specifically about explaining the evidence about the wallet, 
or the moon box or whatever the items were uh, and rebutting whether, for example, the wallet really was there or there was some misleading impression about you know, finding a wallet in the victim's home. Uh, and critically, it's kind of the last general legal principle I, I want to tell the court about, which is in, in all these cases, the court applies the general principles that apply in all the rules of evidence. So in all four of the cases with the state sites where this court said the door had not been opened, uh, the court, this court engages in a relevance and an unfair prejudice analysis, you know, rule 403. So it's not that a door, the door is open to otherwise inadmissible evidence and then the trial court has no ability to make individual fact determinations about whether this evidence is actually relevant, whether it's unfairly prejudicial. Uh, that is part of the door opening analysis. So in State versus Campbell, that's what this court said, that that kind of evidence uh, would be highly prejudicial and inflammatory and not relevant to uh, the question about whether there was uh, an intentional killing uh, in that case. Uh, and, and one final kind of case illustration is Lynch. And this was a case, uh, sorry, yes, Lynch, uh, where the state uh, argued that there was, um, well, the defendant testified as to his criminal record. It was another murder case. And the state said, well, now, because you testified about your criminal record, uh, we can ask you any detailed questions about uh, the bad, prior bad acts that you, the defendant, engaged in. And that was allowed by the trial court. Uh, and this court reversed the conviction and said, again, that's not how door opening works. You can't just say, because the other side raised some general topic, the other side gets to ignore the rules of evidence. And of course, uh, there was, there's very detailed rules on when you can ask the defendant about their prior bad acts. Uh, and we shouldn't let that kind of rule uh, be exploited in, in that way. Uh, and so I think that just reinforces that the opening the door principle has to be narrowly circumscribed, otherwise it starts to swallow the rest of the rules. So in, in closing, I, I would just tell the court what the defense counsel told the jury uh, in closing which is that this is a very tragic situation on multiple levels where two young men uh, immaturely engaged in this aggressive confrontation on the public streets of Durham and one of the men ended up dead. And what the defense counsel said to the jury is, and, and the state wholeheartedly agrees with, is that Mr. Brandon did not deserve to die. Uh, on the facts here, Mr. Brandon should be alive today. Uh, and because the defendant was convicted only of voluntary manslaughter, uh, he is actually a free man today. Uh, he has served his entire uh, term of incarceration, and his period of supervised release expires later this year. Uh, and uh, as this court knows, uh, you had an argument yesterday uh, in Hicks, usually in this circumstance, when there's testimony that a, or, or there's a record that shows uh, that a person sh intentionally shot another person in the back as they were running away, what you have on appeal is a murder case. Uh, and often what's at issue on appeal is whether there should have been an instruction on self-defense at all. Uh, and there are multiple cases where this court has said on those fact patterns, uh, it's actually permissible for the trial court not to instruct on self-defense. But here what we have is an instruction that was given, a voluntary manslaughter conviction uh, that was consistent with the defendant's theory at trial. And uh, I guess I would just close by saying that the state sincerely hopes that David McCoy is well on his way to integrating into society, that he's gonna live a long, productive and peaceful life and the defendant uh, deprived Augustus Brandon of that opportunity. And so the fair, just, appropriate outcome in the state's view is to affirm his conviction for voluntary manslaughter. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Rebuttal. If I have a few seconds left, Chief Justice Newby, I want to just make a couple of points. When I said that there's no standard of review separate for the opening the door question, I meant it. And what the state has argued to you, based upon Campbell, does not show that. The issue in Campbell was whether the defendant should have been allowed to question witnesses about sexual paraphernalia in the victim's home. The judge's ruling was a 403 ruling more prejudice to the state than probative for the defense. That is reviewed as a question of abuse of discretion, and that's what this court said. 
when it went to the issue of whether the state had opened the door, it simply ruled. It's not clear the trial judge ruled on that question. It's not clear there was a question about opening the door to review at all. If the only evidence presented by the state about Mr. Brandon from his parents was that he was a happy guy, I would agree with the state. That's not all. There was much more. And it all went to his possession of a gun. And with respect to Justice Tyson's dissent. He not only said that the door had been opened, but he also said opening the door kept meant that the evidence should have come in, and if it had, it would have been prejudicial. So the prejudice issue is here. There is no single decision by this court, if you look at them, that looks at the opening door question as a separate issue from the ruling of the trial judge with respect to why the evidence is not coming in or is coming in. If it's a 403 ruling by the trial judge, it is abuse of discretion. The ruling is abuse of discretion. The implication is that if the door had been opened, then the trial judge would be wrong because fundamental fairness would require it. But in Campbell, they said the trial judge was right, that opening the door question wasn't much to speak of, as the state has indicated. This is a case where the door was open. This is a case where it was prejudicial, and you can't make the defendant guilty on some theory that his lawyer admitted guilt of voluntary manslaughter. That's clearly not what happened in closing argument. He didn't have any authority to do that. I thank the court's indulgence and patience. Thank you. Thank you both. Mr. Clark.